So, uh, you know, I think people need to really see the world as it is rather than as they would like it to be. And uh, and the seriousness of this is, um, it, I mean, it's life and death. We're talking about whether our country is going to survive. We're talking about whether liberty is going to survive. If Americans don't start getting it, um, catastrophe awaits. It's just that simple. I'm not trying to sound alarmist or pessimistic. It's just the reality. If we don't start understanding this, it's not going to go well for us. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for December 13th through December 20th, 2022, while supplies last. This week we feature two sovereign coins, the 2022 Silver Krugerrand and the 2023 Silver Britannia with Queen Elizabeth, both at 475 over spot, the lowest premium we've seen on sovereign coins in almost two months. Made by the Rand Refinery and the South African Mint, the Krugerrand is one of the most recognized coins today. These silver Krugerrands are three nines fine and feature a springbok antelope on one side and the portrait of Paul Kruger on the other. The 2023 Britannia from the Royal Mint in London still feature the portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, even though the Royal Mint has already started minting some coins with King Charles. This makes this first run of 2023 Britannia likely to be the last Queen Elizabeth Britannia issued. Both the silver Krugerrand and the silver Britannia come 25 to a tube and 500 to a box, and both are IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a Precious Metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. Our number for all orders is 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this returning guest, author and journalist, Alex Newman from the Liberty Sentinel, and also a contributor at Epic Times, joins us this Thursday December 15, 2022. Alex, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Dunning. The last time we interviewed you, you were just about to step onto a plane to fly out of the country to go visit a global climate summit in Cairo, Egypt, and you've returned. I've, I've heard a couple of the things that you've written and spoken about since then, and it's stunning. So if you could please, for the benefit of our viewers, let us know what's going on at the global level between these leaders of these countries and what they have in store for us for our future and what it reveals about sort of the things that are motivating some of the biggest changes that are happening in our world and therefore what we need to do about it in our own lives. Yeah, thank you, Dunnigan. And uh, I did just get back recently from Egypt, the UN uh they call it the 27th Conference of the Parties, and these are uh, the parties to the UN's climate change process. Um, you know, most Americans are totally in the dark about this meeting. It was huge. They had uh, Joe Biden uh, was there, right? Uh, we had John Kerry, uh, uh, climate czar, running around like a Santa Claus on crack, just, you know, throwing American money and promises of endless American financing around. Um, so this was a very significant event, but almost no media coverage. And I think the reason why the American media uh, refused to report on it, despite its significance, is that uh, if Americans understood what was happening, if Americans even knew that this was going on, uh, there's a very good chance that they would put a stop to it. So I think that's why, um, despite its significance, the American people largely have not even heard that this was happening. But uh, they did come up with their annual agreement. Every year they come up with a new agreement. So they go further. You know, they take step by step by step. You give them an inch, obviously, they'll take five miles. And um, this year, some of the major things that made it into the agreement, uh, for the first time ever, Western governments, including the U.S. government, agreed that uh, Western peoples, uh, they call them developed country parties, basically the countries that are wealthier because of the free market system, because of um, uh, you know advancements and property rights and things like this, uh, they are responsible for climate change. So uh, Americans, that's you, uh, Europeans, Canadians, New Zealanders, Australians, uh, and then maybe the Japanese for good measure, uh, you are all the cause for climate change. So when there's a drought, when there's a storm, when there's a hurricane, a tornado, a, a flood, Blood, whatever it is, um, your governments just pled guilty on your behalf in perpetuity and uh, subjecting you to potentially unlimited liability for what they call loss and damage. Um, that was the big takeaway from there. But I almost feel like the relentless focus on that distracted from some of the more important things that were happening. And, and you know, I don't want to minimize the importance of that. It's huge. Uh, we're talking um, trillions of dollars eventually being redistributed from the poor and the middle class in the United States to the kleptocrats ruling the third world under the guise of these reparations for climate change. But um, in tandem with that, um, 
a lot of other significant things happening. And I mean, there, there's so many we'll never have time to talk about them all. But I want to highlight some of the major ones. Uh, they agreed in this final agreement. They call it the uh, Sharm el Sheikh Implementation Plan. That was the outcome document here. Uh, they agreed that they're going to totally restructure the global economy. And uh, they expect this to cost, they say, in the text of the agreement, between four to six trillion dollars every single year. Uh, that's on top of the six trillion dollars that developed country parties, again, the U.S. government, et cetera, are expected to swipe from their taxpayers to give to uh, third world governments. So we're, we're literally talking many, many trillions of dollars per year are going to begin flowing from what's left of the middle class in the Western world to the uh, the UN and the kleptocrats uh, misruling much of the third world. So um, when they talk about restructuring the economy, they mean that in a very literal sense. Uh, they say production has to be changed. And of course, the only way to change production is for the government to intervene. Uh, consumption has to be changed. They say uh, all the banks have to get on board with this. Uh, all the businesses have to get on board with this. And then the the other major thing that happened there is the religious push. So, um, you know, the U.N. brings together all the governments. But of course, the governments have a major credibility problem. Right. Um, the U.N. and uh, the World Economic Forum signed a, a, a they call it a strategic partnership in 2019 to bring the business community of the world to the table on uh, implementation of the climate change goals, the Agenda 2030, the sustainable development goals, they call it. Well, now they're bringing the third leg of the stool in is how uh, Peter Drucker, the management guru, described it. You got to have the three legs of the stool, governments, private sector and religion. And so the religion was a major theme of this conference. They had over 40 events dealing with religion. And I put that in air quotes. Uh, they had leaders uh, or self-proclaimed leaders of Judaism, Islam, uh, different Christian denominations. Right. The Vatican had an emissary, uh, Orthodox churches, um, uh, the um, uh, evangelical churches, right? The Archbishop of the Evangelical Church of Finland was a big supporter of all this. And so, um, you know, there's, again, way too much to describe in this short time. This will all be in the cover story of the next issue of the New American Magazine. But they came up with a new Ten Commandments. Um, and at the UN, the secular side of the UN uh, actually put out a report uh, before the conference even started where they said that this system of morality, ethics that evolved with humanity over the last few thousand years is not adequate to um, what's necessary right now to preserve and protect Mother Earth. And so they actually say, you know, it's probably time for a new moral code to be uh, uploaded into this. So they came up with a new Ten Commandments. They did this very bizarre climate repentance ceremony on the top of Mount Sinai. And so what we're seeing now is the unification of all these global religious movements, religious leaders to add their weight, their voice to this push for basically shackling humanity under a, a UN authority. And all of this, of course, under the guise of regulating the gas of life, the gas that we exhale, carbon dioxide, which we're being told is a toxic pollution that's going to kill the planet unless we pay taxes and give up our freedom. Uh, speaking of giving up our freedom, that's often been, regardless of what the uh, global problem that's being put forward seems to be, whether it's terrorism, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a climate, it doesn't matter. The response is often giving up our freedom. Can you focus on that aspect of this and how it applies specifically here and in general to these other things as far as a broader pattern? It's so funny you mentioned that because one of the things that I've done is look into the past pronouncements of the climate movement. And, uh, you know, a lot of the younger people, you know, before I was even born back in the late 70s and 1980s, uh, the very same goobers that are screaming the loudest today about global warming, climate catastrophe, climate hell coming, uh, were actually screaming very loudly about global cooling. Um, and what's really interesting to note is they said that it was human emissions of CO2 that were causing global cooling. Uh, and what's also very interesting is that the solutions to global Global cooling were practically exactly the same solutions as the solutions to global warming, uh, with a few added things for good measure, right? Uh, in Life magazine, Time magazine. Uh, these climate experts and scientists actually proposed, and I'm not kidding, you can go back and look at this, uh, in the late 70s, they proposed covering the Arctic ice cap with black soot to melt it to supposedly prevent global cooling. But of course, you had uh, drastic restrictions on energy. You got to give up your freedom. You got to give us a ton of money. Um, you know, one of the ringleaders of this whole circus on the American side has been uh, a wackadoodle of the highest order by the name of John Holdren. He served as uh, Obama's White House science czar. Uh, he's still playing a very significant role in what's going on today. And um, he was one of the early global cooling fanatics. And he wrote a couple of books about this. In 1973, he and Paul Ehrlich teamed up and, and wrote one where they called for de-developing, that, that's their terminology, de-developing the United States to save us from these environmental problems. Uh, they called for a global regime to allocate and distribute the resources of the world. Uh, then in 1978, 
They came out with another book called uh, Eco Science, and uh, in this book they said that you know population control was necessary. He actually proposed adding sterilizing agents to the water supply in the United States to sterilize everybody involuntarily, and then you'd have to go to the government for permission to have children, and they'd give you an antidote. Um, he also proposed, and I'm, I, people can go verify this themselves, forced abortions. And uh, incredibly, he actually said this would probably be compatible with our existing constitution if the population crisis got severe enough. So these are the people who are guiding this policy. But uh, you're right. The solutions to the global cooling and then to the global warming now to the climate change. They've since started calling it climate crisis, climate emergency. And at this one, they called it climate hell. It's always the same thing. Give up your freedom, shut down your economy and become totally dependent on our global technocratic controls. Um, and you bring up a really good point. This is, seems to be uh, for these people pushing this the solution to absolutely everything. Uh, we just had two and a half years of this. You know, the solution to disease, the solution to international health crises is give up all your freedom, right? Uh, submit to endless surveillance, forget the Fourth Amendment, uh, submit to radical controls on your business, on your life, on your mobility, on everything. Um, same thing with. That's right. And, and you got to censor the press. you got to rig the algorithms and silence people on social media. Um, and in, in fact, they're doing the same thing. Right. The U.N. Um, communications director, Melissa Flemings, came out uh, just a few months ago in a podcast with the World Economic Forum. And she said, oh, we're so proud of our partnership with Google. You know, it used to be when you type in climate change, you'd get all these climate deniers like Alex Newman saying things like, uh, hey, we ought to really wonder whether this science is actually science. Well, now we're so proud of our partnership with Google where they're suppressing all that and they're promoting UN science as the authoritative results. So um, same thing we see for all these crises, right? You got to silence all of the opposition, manufacture a phony consensus and take away people's freedom. Lots and lots of money needs to be extracted from the middle class. So, um, you know, I, I would think that by now people with pattern recognition, right, one of the basic things that distinguishes us from like animals, uh, we, we should be able to recognize this pattern and say, wait a minute, how can the solution to everything be giving up our freedom? But, um, you know, unfortunately, there's still some people out there watching CNN and, uh, you know, I guess they just don't get it yet. So what do you see as a reasonable avenue for reasonable people to take in the face of that? So you've got these, these people that are out there uh, in these positions of power are going to keep doing this. They're going to keep finding every excuse to say, OK, no matter what happened, we're going to spin it and paint it and catastrophize it in such a way that the solution is giving up your freedoms. Uh, what does an ordinary person, ordinary family, ordinary country do in the face of that? Well, I, I think the first thing to consider is principles, right? Uh, we need to be ruled not by our emotions, um, you know, not by fear. Um, and, and, you know, fear and ignorance are the biggest tools that these people have in their arsenal. And so, first of all, stop being scared. When, when they tell you that there's some kind of crisis and you're going to die or you're going to be in pain or whatever, uh, if you don't do what they say, that ought to instantly set off alarm bells and say, wait a minute. We've seen this before. Um, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to submit to the terror. And one good way to accomplish that is just turn off your TV. Right? It's just psychological terrorism aimed at the American people. There's no reason for anybody to sit in front of this idiot box and, and be told how you need to be really scared and only the government can save you. So stop falling for the fear. And second of all, ignorance. We have got to get past the ignorance. Uh, if the American people were well educated, none of this stuff would work. Right. And, and the climate scam is a really, really good example of that. Right. And, and it's very easy to show that the people who are actually running this don't believe this themselves. And I'll, and I'll explain how in 30 seconds. Communist China emits 300 percent more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than the United States of America. Uh, Communist China emits about double the CO2 that all the Western world combined emits into the atmosphere. And their CO2 emissions are rising like a rocket ship. They are going through the roof. Uh, they're, they're actually putting on between now and 2025, they're put, bringing online more coal fired power plants, new coal fired power plants than the entire existing stock of coal fired power plants in the United States. So if you are believing this hypothesis that CO2, human emissions of CO2 are this dangerous pollution that we need to regulate and control, literally the last thing in the universe you would want to do is shut down factories and manufacturing and economic production in the United States, in Germany and Japan, and move all that production over to China. It's the worst possible thing you could do if you really believed that CO2 was pollution that was going to hurt the planet. And yet, that is exactly what this whole climate change process does. Um, I was in Paris at the UN summit where they came up with the Paris Agreement. 
And I was just my, my jaws on the floor. Here you have Obama saying we're going to cause energy prices in America to skyrocket. We're going to slash CO2 emissions by 30 percent. We're going to use executive orders to shut down power plants. And the communist Chinese come to the table and they say, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we promise we're going to continue increasing our CO2 emissions until at least maybe 2030. We'll take a look at it then. Um, and so thank you, America, for bankrupting your businessmen. Thank you for shutting down your factories. We'll be more than happy to produce all that stuff in China, where every single unit of economic output produces drastically more CO2, atmospheric CO2, than that same unit of economic production in the United States. So that's how you know that the people, the ringleaders running this thing, do not believe the lie themselves. And so what we need to do, I think, to avoid falling for these things is just become educated. Um, There's a reason why the national uh, science standards um, that have been put out by the same people who brought you Common Core, the Bill Gates of the world, et cetera. Uh, There's a reason why in 12 years of so-called education at a public school, these children will never hear the term scientific method. It's because if they knew the scientific method, if they understood the basics of science, they'd know that this is not science. This is pseudoscience. Um, I, I encourage people to just, you know, Go back and look at the historical record here. One of the things that I've done several times uh, in the New American Magazine is just look back at the predictions of this climate change movement, because for over 40 years, they're on record making falsifiable predictions. By the year 2000, X is going to happen. Well, let's look. Did X happen by the year 2000? No, typically exactly the opposite of what they predicted is what happened. So we've got to stop being manipulated by fear and we have to stop being ignorant. I know the TV glorifies ignorance. I know it's the cool thing to be the ignoramus who doesn't know anything. But if we want to keep our freedoms, if we want to keep our country, if we want to preserve the prosperity that uh, our nation and, and much of the world has been blessed with as a result of the efforts of Americans, we're going to have to get over this obsession with being ignorant and stupid. We're going to have to say, hey, we got to learn about these things. And uh, I I think it's very important that people do that. You very subtly uh, mentioned half of the problem there when you talked about the government schools manufacturing uh, ignorant uh, graduates who don't know, not only they don't know their history, they don't know the the scientific method, they've never heard of it, but they don't even know basic uh, rational reasoning and argumentation and persuasion to understand how they're being manipulated. Uh, You've also talked about solutions to that problem of manufactured government uh, graduates who aren't able to function as thinking adults. And what are some of those options? Uh, I think to sum it up uh, as concisely as possible, get your children out of the public schools as quickly as you possibly can. Screaming at your school board is not going to make one bit of difference. Calling the principal, opting your child, none of those things are going to make any difference at all in the long term. Um, I cannot encourage parents highly enough uh, to in, in in stronger terms to get their children out. Uh, and this was actually really clear at the climate summit too. They had a youth and children pavilion. Uh, they had all these so-called educators, including the leader of the largest teachers union in the world, uh, the Education International. They purport to represent 33 million educators around the world. Um, and they all of them, I mean, the Secretary General of the UN said, look, the solution to the climate crisis is, quote unquote, education. Right. And so they're dead serious. They understand better than almost anybody on our side understands that brainwashing the children is their key to victory. Um, if they can manipulate 75, 80, 90 percent of the up and coming generation, uh, all hope of turning this around is lost. Um, so there's a reason why they're doing this. It's very strategic. And I interviewed a lot of these young people. The ignorance was almost unfathomable. I mean, you almost can't put into words how shocking this ignorance is. And they've all been trained. I mean, they're like trained SEALs. Well, what do you think about this element of the science? What do you think about that element of the science? Well, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I trust the science. I mean, it's just like parrots. They just repeat. I'm not a scientist, but I trust the science. They have been trained. They have been programmed to mindlessly repeat the same thing. And then I'll tell them, hey, I've interviewed a whole bunch of the scientists on the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they told me this whole thing is a fraud. What do you think about that? I'm not a scientist, but I trust the science. It's just they're just parroting the same thing. So I cannot emphasize uh, highly enough. uh, Parents, if you don't protect your children, if you don't ensure that your children get a good education, they are not going to get a good education. And that's going to have implications and ramifications for your family, for the future well-being of your children, and also for your community, your country, your church, um, all of it. You know, you just mentioned this uh, parroting the name of science uh, but completely covering up uh, unscientific uh, methods. It's the exact opposite of what's being... That's That method, that method of operation has become trademarked for 
government and globalist uh, initiatives. The bills coming through Congress are always named the exact opposite of what they're actually going to do. The, we had Fauci saying, you know, if you're, if you're questioning me, you're questioning science. It's like, that is not <laughs> science. That's the opposite because science always questions itself and is always willing to, to test hypotheses against observable reality and what's, what's actually successful, what's actually working. And uh, on and on and on. This is where the twisting and the inversion and what Dr. Edwin Vera, a constitutional attorney, says, you know, operating under the color of law. So it gets back to another aspect of what you're, what you're talking about is always using words to invert, to subvert, to twist, to, re, to conceal, to, to um, undermine a true understanding of ordinary people. Uh, how, can, how can people uh, stay... Uh, savvy to that? How can people inoculate themselves against that inversion and that twisting of reality through the use of language that always means the opposite of what it says? Uh, it goes back to the ignorance issue. And, you know, uh, there's actually a perfect example of exactly what you're describing. This Inflation Reduction Act was marketed as a tool to conf contain inflation. And yet, if you had gone to this summit in Egypt, um, all the U.S. government officials were openly bragging about how this was going to spend unlimited amount, I mean, unprecedented amounts on climate change policy. So they're, they're sitting there bragging about, hey, you know, we call it the Inflation Reduction Act, but this is the biggest investment in climate that has ever been made in history. And we're going to be buying windmills and solar panels from the Ch communist Chinese, incidentally. Uh, they were so proud of the fact that they duped idiot Americans and even many in Congress into supporting a bill that has nothing to do with inflation reduction. In fact, exactly the opposite, spending huge amounts of money, destroying our economy, destroying our energy grid, which is, of course, going to produce massively more inflation. So uh, I, I think uh, Americans and people around the world need to understand uh, just what you said. When they name a bill something, you ought to assume as a starting point, it's really the opposite of that. Uh, when the CDC tells you to do something for your health, you ought to assume that they are not being honest. And next year, our governor here in Florida just said, we're going to put together a public, uh, public health integrity commission to counter the nonsense and propaganda coming out of the CDC. So uh, you know, I think people need to really see the world as it is rather than as they would like it to be. And uh, and the seriousness of this is, um, it, I mean, it's life and death. We're talking about whether our country is going to survive. We're talking about whether liberty is going to survive. If Americans don't start getting it, um, catastrophe awaits. It's just that simple. I'm not trying to sound alarmist or pessimistic. It's just the reality. If we don't start understanding this, it's not going to go well for us. Alex, how can people stay connected with your writing and your uh, speaking? Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Dunnigan. Um, all of my climate reporting is over at thenewamerican.com. We're actually doing a special issue on this subject. It'll have three of my major articles. You can subscribe to the magazine at thenewamerican.com. Uh, my personal website is at libertysentinel.org. And um, I do a lot of other stuff, but that's uh, you know a good starting point. And thank you once again for having me, Dunnigan. It's always uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining us again here on Liberty and Finance. Thanks so much. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. 
That's 1-888-815-4237.